Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Matchbook Horse Racing podcast. And we've got some brilliant stuff coming your way over the next just shy of an hour or so with the first two days of the Entry Festival covered. So that's going to be Thursday, Friday. Uh, Saturday's Grand National Day will be previewed on Thursday after deck. So uh, fear not, we'll have that for you. But we'll get, we're get a little way before uh, decks. So this is just days one and two of Aintree. Uh, and bundles are grade ones. We kick off with four grade ones. It doesn't really start any better as far as a meeting goes. And it's relatively open as well for grade one contests. Uh, don't forget the Masters podcast is out currently, the Matchbook Masters preview. Masters obviously also getting underway on Thursday and the pre preview is out now. There's also a Premier League preview coming your way tomorrow, hosted by Dan Hussey. Basically, there's just a shed load of sport and it's all covered on your Matchbook podcast. So it's well worth liking and subscribing so you get all of those sports previewed as and when you like it. Best no-cost way of supporting this podcast if you like it. And if you don't, then um, I don't know why you're here. So there you are. Uh, it's 4.45 tomorrow, incidentally. 4.45 tomorrow for our Grand National podcast. There you go. Excellent team of maths for you. You can see that if you are listening on the podcast. I can tell you that it's Matt Toombs, it's Michal Deasy, and it's Charlie Post. And we're going to get stuck into the manifesto. 1.45 at Aintree. It's uh, Ginny's Destiny and Grey Dawning going up against each other with a bit of Ilete Tong thrown in for good measure. I'm a no bet. And in fact... Maybe you don't even want to bother with those three because DC's found a, a bit of value. Welcome back, DC. You good? Probably good, Tom. Probably good. Uh, looking forward to entry. Been quiet the last few weeks, but uh, the good stuff is coming back. Um, I was talking about this last few days, but I, I want to be opposing as much of the Cheltenham horses as possible. If the ground is going to be heavy, if it's heavy ground, the Cheltenham, it's going to be a slog here as well. And I was just looking at this race and... Um, Top grade awning and Ginny's Destiny got stuck into each other a good bit out. Um, they definitely, they they were, it was definitely coming up the hill that they started racing. Um, then you have Elete Thomas, which I think he's stepping up and trip. Um, blew out a bit of Cheltenham again. He does, he's in the last few years. And I was just going on through it and I saw Blow Your Wad by Tom Lacey. Now he's, uh, he has 10 pounds to find with Elete Thomas and Ginny's Destiny on ratings. A um, bit more of a great awning, but... He's had a good year. He's progressed nicely through the year. Um, he won the pen the last time, which was a, a, a career best. I mean, he's he hasn't been out of the, the he said two wins in two seconds this year. Um, finished well beaten by Ingenie's Destiny at Cheltenham in January. But this is a this is definitely the toughest one of his career. But again, he comes here fresh. Um, if he can run a bit above his rating and the rest of them can run a, a bit below their ratings, he's going to be banging there. He's 10.0. Um, I'd rather be back in something fresh and that doesn't have that hasn't had a hard race recently in, in, in the first rest of the week, although the top three are, are good horses. I just want to have a bit of value in this. Uh, well, fundamentally, at, at, at 2.0, nobody's with Grey Dawning, which is interesting in itself. He was the closest I got to, but uh, just I, I don't know, Matt. New, new, there was everything about the new course at Cheltenham and, and the way the race panned out that suited him. I think he's the best of them, and I, and I think he will probably win. But I do have in the back of my mind he's he's a he's a he's a three miler, I think, in the making. So that's a slight concern for me here. You're with a horse stepping back up in trip. Yeah, and and I was a bit tempted by Grey Dawning as well. Slightly odds against. I think he's probably, as you say, the best of these. Uh, I'm with DC on worrying about the the Cheltenham four. You need to look at each race individually, but particularly over staying trips where they've got racing early on. We'll come on to that. Um, for me, this revolves around which Elete Tonk turns up. If the horse that jumped well and won the Irish Arkle turns up, he's a huge price. If the horse that jumped so poorly at Cheltenham where he's disappointed for a third year in a row, he's no chance. But his five and a half length second to Gaelic Warrior on heavy ground over an extended 2-3 at Limerick at Christmas. I know the way you think an American Mike uh, behind that gives um, optimism that he'll handle this sort of test. That's a really good run for me. Gaelic Warrior is the standout novice of the season when he's behaved himself. So Grey Dawn is a much more solid proposition. At the prices, I'll take a chance on Ilete Tom. But at small stakes, it, it would be uh, one of my least strong views of the day. Yeah, that's why I'm a no bet in the race all in. Charlie? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those races, isn't it? There's a, there's a lot of things to take on trust and that. I mean, I, I agree with you, boys. I think Grey Dawning is the best horse in the race and the, and the best long-term prospect for this. But there wasn't much between him and Ginny's destiny at Cheltenham. And I just felt with this sharper test of this track, it, it gives Ginny's destiny a, a sporting chance of reversing the, the form with Grey Dawning. I did toy with the idea of blow your wad, but... I, with with the Cheltenham, the, the lack of the the Cheltenham experience that Dees has flagged up, but I'm just not convinced he's quite good enough to to even with these being slightly below par to to, to close that gap. And Ilete Tom, I think jumping has proved an issue. It seemed it again at Cheltenham, and, and I'd say I'd nearly say the Marmay course at Aintree offers more of a jumping test than Cheltenham does nowadays. So that put me off at him, and he and he what he certainly wasn't big enough to to chance him with, with, with those reservations. So Ginny's destiny for me, for, for all that I think probably Grey Dawning is the best one in this race. Uh, just to come back to the, the prices um, on match, but we can see exactly what they are. Uh, touched on Grey Dawning. Uh, if he is a shade of odds against uh, 2.04, I feel is about where he should be. Il is 4.9. And um, Ginny's destiny is 4.9. 4.7 and there's not much between them colonel harry 26 and uh blow your wad is 11.0 so uh, yeah but that's why i'm sitting out i don't there's enough in there at the prices for me to take a, a strong view at this stage and uh, let us know your your nap uh for aintree and um I'll, I'll send it out there on the show welcome along all who are watching along live we move on to the next of the grade ones hot off the the back of the manifesto is the juvenile contest uh, well, I'll, I'll kick off here. Uh, let's have a look at the, the prices. 1.88 Sergino. Cargis is 4.4. Calif de Berle is 7.8. Nürburgring is 11.0. Then we're into the, the bigger prices. 21.0 into Lotto. Dirty dead, any price you like, really. Uh, I am going to be putting up a, a lot of Nicky Henderson horses for Aintree. Um, I'm taking a view that he the, these horses are going to be too big. Um, I might look stupid, but if on day one, Sergino cops and, and does so comfortably, then it'll affect the prices for the rest of the weeks. So uh, the, the next couple of, um, or Thursday, Friday, I'll, I'll be putting up a few Henderson horses. One of those is Sergino. Um, he was shorter than this to win a triumph before everything went to shit with the Henderson yard, sadly. And uh, the, the the best of the triumph lot don't even show up here. The, the second in the triumph is here. But but if that horse couldn't win that, I don't see how he can beat Sergino, who um, is, I think, comfortably still the, the, the best we've seen. Madsburg was very impressive. But that Cheltenham performance from Sergino, I, I, I still hold in the highest regard. And I'm just going to take a view that uh, that price is too big and that he wouldn't be lining up here if all was not well. So hopefully I don't look stupid. I think that's a very fair price and I will hope that he runs at, at, to, to the best of his ability. If he does, he will win this a canter, in my opinion. So I'll take that price. Charlie and Matt, you're no bets, but I think he's going to be laid in a few places when we get to the best lays. Uh, DC, you like the O'Brien second string? <laughs> so I think we've got you. Go on, come back. That blended. Um, I like Intelata, the the just for Brian Horse. He um, again, look, I'm, I'm just looking at. You no, know, he's he hasn't had as much of a break as um as Sergino, and like he, he didn't run a Chelsea game, kind of Burley, but he started off his season in um the three three year old juvenile hurdle at Christmas and won fairly easily. Um, it was the race that uh, Joseph started off, Sir Eric, and as well. He has two good wins on heavy ground this year. Again, I'm operating on, on the basis that it's going to be closer to heavy than, than soft at entry. Um, so he just has, he has he's some weight catching form. He won on, in heavy ground at Limerick, beating the horse called Carl Torrell, giving him basically a stone. Um, that horse, Carl Torrell, has, has kind of decent enough form behind another horse called Butler Secret, who ran very well there at Fairly House a few weeks ago. Um, again, this is just a value thing. Um, I might play him in the without market as well because if Sergino is on, he should he should beat these easily. 
but I think at the the price he is of fifteen point zero at the moment, I think I'd, I'd have to have a, a small bet. I couldn't leave him alone at that. Uh, okay, and as I said, we I think we're going to come back to to this race in the Thursday lays. Uh, yes, we are. Um, right after this, we've got the entry bowl, which looks a a fairly belting renewal. Uh, Jerry Colon, second in the Gold Cup, 2.8. Shishkin, didn't run it, 3.9. Corbett's Cross, brilliant winner of the Three Mile Six race, 4.8. A Brave Man's Game with cheap pieces, 11.0. Hoyce in your 14.5. Gentleman's Game, 28.0. Why don't we start there, DC, at the biggest price of the lot? Take it away. Yeah, um, this is some race. They, like they're all uh, top class horses. Um, I, I, I kind of had. A bit of a fancy for gentlemen's game. That man, not a fancy for him today. I had my eye on going to the Gold Cup. Um, for all that it was going to be a tough ask for him to come back after so long a break without a prep race to to, to run well in it. But he ran fine. I mean, he was pulled up. He wasn't um wasn't ridden for home, and he you know that 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 might have saved him a small bit. This it could, could put him spot on for this as well. Um, I mean, he started out the season by beating um. Well, this is the second round of the season. He beat Gentleman's Game in the Charlie Hall. The soft ground, heavy ground won't be a problem for him. I think he's just incredibly overpriced at 25.0. I'd have him a lot closer to um, a high senior's price or Brave Men's Game price. He should definitely be around 10.0, 9.0 at least. So you're getting nearly three times that. Um, so I'll definitely be having um, a win bet on him. And hopefully we'll be getting three places on, on the exchange as well for this. So I'll probably back him three places as well. Stephen says quite simply by Facebook, Corbett's Cross, and you might well be right. He's a, a fascinating addition oh. to the race. How are you, Steve? Know him from? You uh, him. Yeah, you might know him, Charlie. He he was uh, he was right off for Alan King and four people. He's from uh, from the Manway. He would have known Noel Feely and Charlie Man. Yeah, no, I know Steve. Uh, Steve well, so yeah, yeah, Corbett's Cross. Yeah, do I? I mean, it's, he, he's a fascinating contender, isn't he? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Might have to get you on the podcast. Um, no, none of us gone with Corbett's. So, gentlemen's game for DC will come down in price. So, Matt and Charlie are singing from a similar hymn sheet. Matt? Yeah, on Corbett's cross, a fascinating contender. And Emmett Mullins does things differently. Think about Ferranelli last year, you know, bumpers, novice hurdles, then an open grade three. A couple of weeks later, he's winning a grade one novice chase at Punchestown. So he's a breath of fresh air. The problem is when these Cheltenham Festival winning novices go into open company later in the spring, they always get overbet and he's just a bit short. Uh, my racing fan's hat on. I'd like to see him win. Just on your point about the Nicky Henderson horses, if, like Tom, you fancy uh, some of those to bounce back here, I'd be tempted to do Ackers um, because, as Tom's pointed out, if Sergino wins, a lot of them are going to shorten. So take the prices now. You're getting a related contingency accumulated uh, effectively all on the same issue. Uh, the one I like, yeah, again, I want to take on the front of the market. Corbett's Cross a bit short. Uh, Jerry Colom had a really hard race in second in the, the Gold Cup. But horses coming from that um, to the bowl when they've been involved in the business there don't have a great record. So I'm taking a bit of a chance on my old friend, Ahoy Senor. He's back at Aintree in the spring. Last three seasons, he's produced his best run of the season at this meeting. Won the Sefton the mile, May. Last year's one and a half length, second to a, an on-a-going day Shishkin. And that was after having been sent clear to win his race. He was steadied into the last fence and lost all momentum. Now, he's not been in form this season. Um, doesn't run well fresh. I'll excuse him early on. It's a decent 10 lengths fourth in a steadily run Cotswold. Stirrup snapped four out. So carrying the full £6 penalty, that was a decent effort. And then he's inexplicably run twice over intermediate trips. He's a galloper. He stays really well. Best suited by front running, getting a good look at his fences. His jumping's a real mixed bag, isn't it? Um, he may well get an uncontested lead here. So he wouldn't want the ground too deep, but it's normally quickest on the mile made track. So I'm hopeful it'll be soft rather than heavy on that course, which should be OK. He's obviously a chancy proposition, but I want to take on the front of the market. Uh, and as we know about him, if he puts it all together, he has a chance at his favourite meeting. Charlie, what do you want to add? Yeah, not not a lot, a whole lot to add, Tom. I mean, like like um, Matt said, you know, he, he he really comes alive at this meeting. He was unlucky last year in this race behind Shishkin, and 
you know, yes, this season it hasn't gone to plan, but there, there's been the odd excuse here and there. And I didn't think the Ryanair run was that bad, considering he didn't really get into any sort of jump, jump in rhythm, which is his one. But back up in trip, I think will suit him well. And he's a horse with enough ability to win this. And just at the prices, I, I think he's a chance worth taking at sort of 13.0. I'm, I'm interested in Alex's comment who said BMG is a better horse than Jerry, uh, which is um, what is bollocks, really. <laughs> but Alex, I love your contributions always, and you're an integral part of this, uh, this podcast. What do the official ratings say? That's what I always ask myself at a time like this. They say Brave Man's game is a three pound inferior horse to Jerry Colomb, but either way, he's not he's not quite the horse he was. Uh, but as Steve Jones would say, ratings mean fuck all or whatever, doesn't it? So. He would, yes, he would. Uh, and Stevie Donovan says Alex needs his head check. This is good. I like see, I like this, Alex. Strong opinions, however wrong they may be, just get people talking. That's what we like on this podcast. That's why I'm putting up Sergino. Anyway, um, I, I I I started the race by being by thinking I'm going to take on Jerry Colom, and now I picked him at two point eight. It was just the, you know, he 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 had a hard race at the festival last year. I know it was different, but then he came back and won at, at Aintree. Uh, he is he's just for me. He's he is comfortably pick of this division aside, obviously from the Gold Cup winner now. And it, I know it's a risk, but I felt two point eight was there was enough juice in that in that price to, to risk him. Um, I know it's been argued he's better fresh possibly, but you know, he, he has, he has bounced back from, from Cheltenham last year to win again off, off the back of a four week absence. So there was, there was just enough in the prices to have him on side. I thought Jerry Colum at 2.8, but it's not a very strong opinion. All right, moving on to the uh, staying hurdle. So Bob Ollinger is 2.5 and Perry Pass 2.82. Langadan 12.5, Lucia 14.0, 19.0, uh, and the mean line, bigger prices thereafter, similar price, Marie's Rock. Right. I'm impre I'm 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 surprised, team, that Charlie and Matt in particular would rather have Impere pass at around about 2.8 than Bob Ollinger at 2.5. Charlie, you can tell me why. I mean, just I, I just think that there is still better to come from Empire Pass and look after last year's Ballymore route where he he, he absolutely battered Gallic Warrior. He, he looked like he was going to become a genuine top notcher. It hasn't quite happened thus far, but he has been beat by Tupu and State Man. So subsequent Cheltenham Festival winners. And yes, I agree. Bob Ollinger finished in front of him last time. And in theory, both of them are going to be suited by this step up half a mile in trip. But I thought front running didn't really work for Impare Pass the, the last day. I'd be very, very surprised if those tactics are repeated again with Paul Town ending the plate to, um, tomorrow. And it's just a hunch that for whatever reason, Impare Pass it hasn't quite happened for him so far this season. But there's still time for him to to sort of realise the, the abundant promise he showed as a novice. Whereas I think Bob Ollinger, we know where he's at. He, yeah, I think he's absolute best days are behind him for all that this season he's had a little bit of a renaissance and it, it just more I, like I say I just feel that there's still more to come from Empire Pass and it wouldn't surprise me bypassing Cheltenham if we don't see an upgraded performance from what we've seen thus far this season uh, Go on Matt pick up off that Yeah Charlie's talking about the two main points. The first one is, you know, you need to ignore that run, as Charlie said, in the Irish champion hurdle, because he didn't like making the running. Now, if you then go back to the Matheson, he was three and a quarter lengths behind State Man, gave him much more of a race there under the right tactics than Bob Ollinger did when five and a half lengths second in the Irish champion hurdle. And as uh, Charlie said, yeah, Bob Ollinger's nine, yeah, having a last peak probably. Imperial Pass is only six, only run eight times, starting a couple of years ago. So he's still on the way up. Um, and Bob Ollinger actually has only run once after Cheltenham. He bombed out of punches down. Now, that was in a three-mile chase, so he's got an obvious excuse. But he does have to prove he trains on to this time of year. So, yeah, with that better form with State Man over the, the season, open to much more improvement and a bit of a time-of-year question mark over Bob Ollinger, I think Imperio Pass ought to be favourite. 
So you're strong bet with him here. And my, well, my best bet of the day is Bob Ollinger, who I like the angle that he's been kept fresh for this. And I I, I, I felt there were fewer question marks about him than, than in Pere Pass. And I still think he retains an absolute shed load of ability, which we saw with his performance last time. All right, he was put in his place by State Man, but that that was a a run over an in, inadequate trip for him. Um, prior to that, uh, I know he only beat Marie's Rock, but I mean, it, I think two and a half miles on testing ground is exactly what he wants. My view would be that he there should be more between Bob Ollinger and Impere Pass in the betting, and therefore I'm strong bet Bob Ollinger. And DC, you are just going to have them both in a reverse forecast. You're like the referee. Yeah, um, I think Impere Pass will go off favours. I think he's he's been, he's been backed already, but I I don't see much to challenge either of the two of them. So stick him in a reverse forecast and. Boost your, boost your odds a small bit. It's a simple enough uh, play. It worked a few times at Cheltenham with a, in, in race like this, and I'm, I'm just going to stick with it. I think uh, Imperial Pass will go off favourite, though. I think Bob will drift a small bit. Um, I couldn't tell you which one will win. You did it with the champion hurdle, right? You did State Man and... Uh, and, and, the, and yeah. I think, I don't know, I put up Embassy Gardens and Carmers Cross as well. There was one other one. Anyway, look... That I just if in in a, in a race like this, I think the rest of them are. I'd say Langer Dan will probably be running out for third. Like I, I can see him running all right in this. Can anyone have us give me a sensible line on Langer Dan, Matt? Um, he got a great chance in next year's Coral Cup. <laughs> Good, that's sensible. Thank you. Yeah. We'll leave it there. I like it. Fox Hunters four oh five. The, the Coral Cup trouble. Yeah, this one. <laughs> four oh five at Aintree. Uh, God knows what's what's going to be as a agenda. What illness is going to strike him this year? Right, I'm no bet. Uh, there are the odds. It's pretty open. Five point six to fill with. It's on the line. Spyglass Hill six point zero, eight point zero, and a mix. Time leader eight point four. Charlie Post. The floor is yours. Having found Sine Nomine at Cheltenham. Yeah, um, I definitely wouldn't be as strong about this as I was about her at Cheltenham. Um, I mean, I've ended up coming down with with Benny's King, who was who was second last year to famous Claremont. Um, I think he's nine point zero. He he's come into this with a with a similar sort of prep, and and he look he he absolutely bolted up at Leicester in in a relatively weak under chase on his latest start. Uh, Sean O'Connor, who rode him then keeps the ride and a 13 year old has won this once in the last 10 years. And I just thought there were question marks over a lot of the ones further at the market. I thought it's on the line would probably struggle for, for gears. He's a, he's quite a sulky horse. I thought he's short enough what he's done. Spyglass Hill won on Hunter Chase debut at, at Haydock, but the form of that Iskander Pecos is okay, but he, he certainly, I'd have thought he'd struggle in a race like this. Animix I wasn't wild about. Time leader is a danger, but but ran at Cheltenham over a trip that probably stretches him. And I thought I had a hard enough race. And and then as is the one in this sort of race, there's plenty of them that, that just probably can't win. So I thought Benny's King was pretty solid. Like I say, he he, he was second to see no nom nominee on his penultimate start at Weatherby. He's good over this intermediate trip. He's he's a he's a prominent racer, which I think you need to be over the national fences, especially over this two and a half mile trip. So yeah, Benny's king. Not as strong as Cine nom nominee, though, Tom. No, fine. 9.4 will do, Matt. Yeah, I was tempted by Benny's king. Um, Sean, though, kind of can't claim his seven pounds here. If you look at the roll call of this race, it's all the top jockeys win. The last three have been won by arguably the leading three British jockeys. Will Biddick, Gina Andrews and James King. You know, Derek O'Connor, Jamie Codd, Nina Carberry. So it's really hard for these uh, inexperienced jockeys in a race like this. Um, so just about put me off him. I, I want to take on it's on the line for exactly the reasons Charlie has said. I do like um, Spyglass Hill. James King's already won this twice on dinner and on 67.0 uh, shot cousin Pascal three years ago when uh, his ride probably made the difference. Spyglass Hill was rated 146 at his peak for Henry de Bromhead. On his last run for Henry a year ago, he was seven and a quarter lengths third to Bacchus and in my design at levels with the winner. So that's pretty good form to be bringing to Hunter Chases. 
On his debut for Regan Palace, he won nicely in the Wall Russ at Haydock in February. That's usually a strong race. Uh, famous Claremont, Christy Beamish and Baby Run all won the Wall Russ before winning this. Um, Scandapec has won a couple of races. Django, uh, who was beat nearly 20 lengths in fourth, got closer um, when fourth in the uh, Cheltenham Festival race. He's only beaten 12 lengths. And Regan Palace's day job is working in Christian Williams' yard. We know how good a target trainer Christian is. So I'd be hopeful Regan will have him prime for the day. Um, he was ridden by a three-pound claimer, Tom Brought at Haydock. You'd have to hope he'd improve again for James King taking over in the saddle. And all four of his wins under rules have come on heavy ground. So the going's very much in his favour uh, here. I think Spyglass Hill is the one to beat. DC. This is a pure dart. There are no leads. Um, the, what drew, the horse I put up is Lieutenant Rocco. Just at a big price. Um, what drew me to him was the, the William Biddick bro, uh, booking. Um, as I said, look, you want to be looking at the jockeys in this kind of race. He was, he was a fair horse a few years ago. Um, there was big things expected of him. Like he finished fourth in the, the cross country last year. I know he was 36 legs links beaten, but um he got around there on soft ground. I mean he he he'd won the time before that. He said two hunter chases um this year. Probably put him spot on for this. I just thought it was an interesting jockey booking and I wanted if if I wanted to back at something, I'd want to go for something at a big price with a with a good jockey in this. So uh, Lieutenant Rocco for Sid Hosey and William Biddick. All right, that's the box hunters done. And we, uh, subsequent to that, got one more to do, which is the Red Rum Handicap Chase. Uh, big prices here. DC sitting this out. Uh, otherwise, we've got a couple of shouts for Whiskey Wealth, uh, which is uh, Matt and I. 6.8 saint Noir. I wanted to take him on given his run style. Unexpected Party, 7.6. Path de Rue, 7.8. Helton 10.0. Whiskey Wealth is 10.0. And we'll just keep going down while I get... Another couple in there. Irish Blaze is 16.5. So that's the other one that's going up. Uh, Matt, my starting point for this race was prominent racers. I know it's not always the way because Evan Williams' horse bucked that trend a few years ago, but Dancing on My Own nearly did it, and he did it again last year. Um, the two horses I'm putting up are Prices, 17.0, Irish Blaze and Whiskey Wealth. Uh, both come here in good form, both handy racers who should appreciate the ground, even though Irish Blaze has been taken out on testing ground before he has one on it. And, like, I'm not going to get carried away with, I, you know, I think the ground will be testing, but I don't think it's going to be a winter bottomless pit. So Whiskey Wealth and Irish Blaze for me, Matt. Yeah, I agree with Whiskey Wealth, as you say, the uh, on the mild made track. Front runners do really well, as they do over the national fences on the two mile five races. Uh, prom, um, hold up horses do much better on the, the hurdles track. There's no uh, cross hurdle. And they have a long run from four out to three out, which uh, evens it up a little bit. Uh, Whiskey Wealth, yeah, he goes on testing ground. One I listed handicap Cosley off one, two, five last time at Goran on heavy. Um, Jump left again there, as he did in a similar race at Ferry House in December. He just looks like he'd be better going left handed. But amazingly, in 15 chase starts, he's always gone right handed. He did win over hurdles a couple of starts ago going left handed at Nace. And Terence O'Brien only trained 93 winners in Ireland, but 10 of them have been in graded handicaps. That's an incredible record. Shows what he can do on the occasions. He gets good material to work with. Excellent target trainer. Uh, answer to Keith, run a blinder to be beaten less than three lengths in fourth in the Martin Pipe. Um, John Shinnick's on 19 winners, so one away from losing his £7 claim. Promising young rider. He's decent value for that. So Whiskey Wealth, he's up £3 from his Irish mark to 136, but he does look to be on a roll. Um, he's decent value. He has shortened a bit, but he is still decent value, I think, here. Charlie, you like the Cheltenham winner? Yeah, I just thought, like, I, th I thought he'd be shorter, if I'm honest. You know, he he, he absolutely hosed in at Cheltenham Unexpected Party. Yes, he's up eight, but he's actually, he's only back up to the sort of mark that he was he was off after winning at Chepstow and, and that he was fifth in the in the Paddy Power in November at, at Cheltenham off. So, I just won. I just felt like this horse has got. He's got probably got more scope for improvement, even though he's nine at two miles as a handicapper. And yes, some of those that finish behind him, the likes of Path the Rue, have a weight turnaround with him. But they'll they'll need that and more because, like I say, I thought I thought he won impressively, and and I was surprised at the moment he's sort of seven point zero. I, I thought he'd be a good bit shorter than that because I thought he was very very impressive at the festival. So. Yeah, with, with the chance of more to come over two miles, I, I thought he was interesting again in this race. 
All right, that is Friday done and dusted. We uh, try again, Thursday done and dusted. No other bets. We've got Matchbook Zero long shots. Reminder that Matchbook Zero goes live at 10 a.m. each day. We pick out the long shots because they're win bets only and you are likely to be getting enhanced odds because of the exchange anyway compared to a sports book and the fact that there is zero margin and zero commission on Matchbook Zero. Mine is Irish Blaze in the race we've just covered, the Red Rum Handicap Chase. Charlie? I need to concentrate. I'm trying to worry. I'm, I'm trying to look at what's going on in the mayor's bumper uh, uh, that DC keeps asking about. Uh. <laughs> so this is basically um, DC's written to Stevie Donovan asking uh, any info on Noel Feely's mayor in the bumper. I mean, this is just it's just like little side side punting. Who's your matchbook zero long shot, Charlie? I always send your twelve point zero. Matt, uh, whiskey wealth in the red rum. DC, gentleman's game and whatever else he's running in. Yeah, he's yeah that that some some uh, some uh, some pony race. Um, yeah. Thursday late, Charlie. Why are you taking on Sergino? Just because I, I'm. I mean, he won on heavy ground at Otoy, but I, I, I always feel Nicky Henderson's aren't on their at their best on this sort of surface. The, the yard for me, I think he's had one one winner from four in the last 14 days. His runner Exeter pulled up. And so, yeah, I, I just just taking that on trust that they're back on song. I think the likes of Cargazy, Caliph de Burley are credible rivals. And yes, for all that he is the best horse in this race, I think there are questions to answer. And at 1.72, I thought he was worth being against. OK. Other lays, Dees? Yeah, just a Johnny Kalam. Um... Tough race in the Gold Cup. Be very hard to to follow it up here, I think. Um, Matt, what do you want to add? Uh, just that last year in the Broadway, he finished full of running, didn't he? And nearly got there um, and therefore backed up by winning the mile. My very different here. He look, looked to finish tired to me at, uh, in the Gold Cup. Yeah. Okay, so just confirming the team are laying two horses I've put up. Thank you ever so much, you bastards. Day two. Oh, no, we've got best bets. Apologies, best bets. Mine is Bob Ollinger. Didn't lay that one, did you? Charlie? Unexpected party in the in the red run. But, hey, Tom, don't worry. We we all trust you. We're behind you. Don't worry. No, you're not. No, you're not. Um, if, incidentally, if anyone has seen... Uh, or try and look out for i think it's on uh, great british racing's instagram there's the, the video of um dan skelton doing some sort of celebratory dance as unexpected party wins um i mean the man can train but christ on he cannot die it's it's uh it's 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 not a good one it's it's not an easy watch matt who's your best bet in perry pass in the entry hurdle dc he in perry pass bob Allinger reverse forecast Keep it simple. Aintree day two. The Mild May Novices Chase kicks things off. Uh, I am sitting this one out as well because I can't quite get my little head around it. But Charlie posts. This was the closest I got after his brilliant run at the festival, Giovinco. Yeah, I, again, I, I completely agree with you. It's a, it's a trappy contest with the likes of, I know the way you're thinking, who, who hosed up in the Kim Yor after looking like it wasn't going to happen early doors. Chianti Classico was good in the Ultima. I mean, but I, yeah, I just thought in the end that, that Giovinco brings genuine grade one form to the table. You know, he, he was good at entry in November, that he got outstayed by stay away fair at Sandown. Yes, for whatever reason, he didn't pitch up in the Corto star, but but then bounced back with a comfortable success in Newcastle. And and then a really good third behind Factor File and Monty Star, who, you know, I think if, if either of those were in this race, there'd, there'd be a very, very short price. I thought 9.0 was was a pretty value bet for a yard that often does well at this meeting as well. And and yeah, the, with question, the, the, you know, there, there are a couple in here that, that could just be very good, but they've also got to step up to this level. And, and, and the likes of, I know you, the way you're thinking, I'm, I just don't know if he can afford to to kind of take as long to warm up as he did at Cheltenham when he won the, the Kim Muir. 
it, it's not going to be as easy to do that. Chianti Classico, I think, has got to show that he can mix it at this level over fences effectively after being very good in the Ultima. And the likes of Iroko and Broadway Boy, I just thought how question marks to answer one after missing Cheltenham and the, the other after just running a, a fine enough race. So I thought Giovinco, I was surprised to see him outside with a whole lot, Tom. Yeah, second that. Dees? The one I'm going for is Hartwood, who was a bigger price um, this morning when I was looking at him, but uh, he's come into there about 7.0. But I still think he has a, a right chance in this. Um, he's quite unexposed over over fences. I mean, this this will be his fifth, I know, but he just had a he won run there last year, was put away, and he's had three runs this season. Um, he absolutely hosed up at the Dublin Racing Festival. He won by... 14 links beating Rien, um, though he was in off a, a featherweight that day, but couldn't have done it um, more impressively. We handled the ground, has has come here fresh. Henry Ollis does well at this meeting as well. Um, I was I, I was very happy with him when he was about 9.0, 7.0, um, getting on the, the skinny side, but I am um, I'd stick with him. Um, I'd give Iroko a right chance as well, but I'm just going for the bigger price. Uh, incidentally, Trevor says, hello all, a bit late, just settling down with a Mary Berry carrot cake coffee and matchbook. What bliss. I tell you what, in that order as well. Congratulations. Uh, Pete says, Hartwood is great value. Uh, Trevor's putting up bets for Saturday today as well. We'll get there. Calm down. Yeah. Well, Dees, you're done. Matt, who do you fancy? Well, sir? Dan overall and I both like Broadway Boy. I, I can see where Charlie's coming on from Giovinco. I was tempted by him. Um, he was a late scratch Broadway boy. Um, he won three of his first four chases, the last of which was a handicap over 3 2 at Cheltenham off 1 4 6 in December. Backed off the boards for that. That form could hardly have worked out better. Um, three under through five, it was second 100 grand handicap at Ascot off a two pound high mark. The fourth wrapper was only beaten a length, and then the third protector up won the Ryanair. Uh, the reason he's this sort of price, he bombed out in the Hampton. Um, he, he and Apple away cut each other's throats. But in addition, uh, Nigel Tristan Davies said he scoped badly afterwards. So if you put a line through that, comes here a fresh horse, but with plenty of chasing experience, the ideal mix. He's taking on some horses who may have had hard races at Cheltenham over staying trips. Yeah, the one concern is the first time cheap pieces. I hadn't had him down as a horse who needed headgear. So it'll be interesting to see what the Tristan Davies team have to say about that. Um, won't stop me backing in, but it might reduce my stake. All right. Now, that is the mild May. So, Giovinco, Broadway Boy and Hartwood for the uh, 145. We move on to the uh, 220. This is a fiendishly tricky handicap hurdle. I'll just give prices when we get there. What have we got similarities-wise? Well, a few of you, to be honest. Uh, I'm most interested in the O'Castle de Mott case. So Matt and Charlie, I'll let you make that. Matt, first of all. So this is about the Martin Pike form, which hasn't been tested yet. I think it looks red hot. Four Irish novices pulling clear, um, any of whom could easily make up into grade one horses. And if the form's as good as I think, there could be a few behind that good enough to win decent handicaps off their current mark. And the fifth and sixth were uh, separated just by half a length at the line. O'Castle de Mott and What's Up Darling both one pound lower here, and they were both allowed to coast home when they couldn't go with the front four, who may be the grade one horses. What's up, darling, looked a bit like a non-stair in the Martin Pipe. That's usually a real test of stamina at the trip, especially on the heavy chewed up ground there this year. Um, drop back slightly in trip, perhaps slightly less testing ground on the sharper track, could see him to better effect. He'd been running at, at two miles over hurdles, but one a point over three, a bumper over two, two. And he's a full brother to Ben Pauling's Your Darling, um, who runs in the top of them, actually, uh, who won a good handicap over 2-5 at Ascot. So I think he can get this uh, trip, and this could well be a less hot contest. With Jack on board, he'd be my number one bet, but in a full field of 22, happy to back two win and place. A cast of not just pulled hard for a long way in the Martin Pipe. Did really well to be beaten less than 15 lengths. Um, as said, also given an easy time in the straight. If he settles, he should have no issue getting 2-4 here. He's a more chancy proposition because he's got to take the occasion and race professionally. The hook going on that worked for one or two like Gaelic Warrior at Cheltenham and Paul Townend taking over, um, that will hopefully help. So uh, win and place bets for me on What's Up Darling and O'Castle Mott. 
Charlie, what do you want to add first of all to a Castle de Mott and who else do you like? Yeah, like like Matt said, he was just too free, wasn't he? Um, the hood proved effective for Willie Mullins and I think Corbett's Cross as well had the first time hood to win at the festival. So I think that's a, a sensible addition. And I just wondered if we might see a slightly more patient ride as well. You know, he was ridden very positively in the Martin Pipe. And, I, you know, I think under a more patient ride, which, which as Matt has said already, it can be very effective over hurdles at entry where the, stra the straight literally goes on and on forever. You know, we've got to remember this also sent off 72 favourite for a bet fair two starts ago. He's one pound lower than that. And, and like I say, there, there was plenty to like about his run, the Martin Pipe, considering how free he was and given the, the, the ability of the four that finished in front of him. So he was a definite player for me. And then the other one I, I put up was Katira. She was, the ground is going to be a concern for her now. If, if, the, uh, if the ground was, if, if we had some drier weather between now and Friday and, and it, it wasn't going to be too demanding, I'd be even more confident about her. She was second to Irish Point in the two and a half mile grade one at the meeting last year. And it's been a, a little bit lukewarm so far this season at Weatherby and then at Kenton where she really should have won behind Coley Cobb. Um, but there was more. She then had a long break since November, came back in March at Kenton and finished fourth behind her stable mate, Boomborn. Nico de Boinville was up that day and, and I thought there was a lot to like about the run. You know, she, she didn't have a particularly hard time of it to finish fourth. Only beat three and a quarter lengths. She's been left on the same mark. Harry Skelton's up now. And again, it, I don't think it's telling anyone anything they don't know with how good these connections are at, at plotting horses out for these handicaps. So I thought Katira was very, very interesting as well. But my enthusiasm would be tempered if the ground ends up heavy by Friday. Dees, you're in agreement with part of that? What's up, darling? Uh, broke my heart as at, at Cheltenham finishing sixth. I put up as my um, one of my other handicap horses to follow, um, and just ran out there by our castle mark, just just approaching the line. Um, look, Matt made the case from I, I I stick with him. I think um, I think he, he he does need soft ground, um, and if he can come on from that, I think he again he's I think he's running off to say in terms of our castle the mark. There was a half link between him, and he's doubled the price. Um, the other one then is making headway for um, Oliver Greenwell and Jasper Guerrero. He finished fourth in the Imperial Cup behind Godente. Um, was just staying on. He was beating eight and a half lengths. I just think he looks like a horse that needs to be stepped up and trip. They've campaigned him bravely. He went. He he ran an, um, uh, a great two with Haydock and, a, and at the entry as well at Christmas in that race that um, Farron Glory was going to win. Going about that as well. Uh, I just think this he's there's probably a lot of upside to him. He's probably better than his marker one to eight. Um, heavy ground should be fine and the step up and trip, I think, should be in his favor as well. So I'd have the two of them. The two prices I want on side are my tie, obviously, because he's like an illness for me. And you know, if he wins and I'm not on, I'll be desperate, but he won't. He's 17.0. I'll play him to, to, to place mainly, uh, or hope he does anyway. I thought he ran given that he. He took some hurdles with him in the Coral Cup. He actually ran a really good race. Uh, yeah, I, I, the ground might be a bit soft, but he is capable and he still ran a brilliant race, even though he jumped poorly last time. The other one is Django Bay, who's a grade one winner. All right, he's probably lucky to be that, but um, he's 13.0 and getting weight from four of these, five of these. I thought I thought he was a, just a much bigger price than, than he should be. He, he's going to need this trip to suit. And there have been two starts where I thought there were signs it did. Then last time I wasn't sure. But just on on ability and, and converting that to him dropping back into a handicap, I, I was very happy to have him on side at 13.0. So those are my two. Uh, plenty of horses going up there. Don't forget insights.matchbook.com for a recap of all the best bets if you want to see in writing exactly what the team have gone for. The top novices hurdle. Matt, I'm going to let you come in first of all, please. You and DC are in agreement. Yeah, I, I think that the, the gelding's form from the, the Supreme, uh, so perhaps the obvious form is the right form to be looking at. I think Mystical Power looks the right favourite, shaped like the classiest horse in the Supreme, um, just got out, stayed in the bad ground. But at the prices, I'm going to stick with Firefox. He did disappoint me a bit in the Supreme, um, didn't get a clear run, stumbled at a crucial moment. 
even with a clear run, he did just finish closer in third than the five lengths he was beaten, but he wouldn't have been um, far behind Mystical Power. Now, he'd been on the easy list after Nace, where he finished lame and Gordon's horses weren't uh, running well at that point in January. So maybe he'll come on for the run in the Supreme. And Gordon said he wishes he'd been more positive uh, with his riding instructions to Jack, saying, won't mess about this time. So I think he's got a decent chance of turning the, the form round with Mystical Power, and he's the value here. Uh, DC? Yeah, um, just another thing on Firefox. I mean, he was very weak in the market on the day. He was um, he was, he was was backed for weeks before the Supreme, and then just on the day he, he drifted. He, I think he doubled in price. He was, he was at 4.5 the morning. I think he went off close to 7.0. And... There was a lot went against him, and he I thought he he finished off well. So just it's more of a price thing. Um, we we'll go again, and like Garden has turned on turned their own horses from Cheltenham to run very well at the entry before. So hopefully this is another one. Well, I'm with Mystical Power, who I thought ran a ran an excellent race in the Supreme, and in particular given all the concerns about his keenness and obviously why he wears the headgear. That was his first start off a little bit of a break. Uh, I, I'm just supporting him on pure talent. I, I think he is the most talented of these. Uh, just at the back of my mind, I have Aintree and the, a lot's made of Cheltenham and the threat it poses uh, sort of mentally to horses. But Aintree, you have that sort of amphitheatre walkway out. So that's tempering my enthusiasm slightly for him because that can get to horses. But that's not going to be enough of a reason for me not to support him uh, because I think he is just the best of them. Uh, and, 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 and there was enough in his price uh, to, to have him on side, uh, even though I didn't write it down in front of me when I, when I made the selection. That was my feeling on it, 3.25. So uh, him versus 4.3 Firefox, I, I would be in the mystical power camp, 3.25. Charlie, you're going for a bigger price. Yeah, I've, I've gone with one that, that bypassed Cheltenham completely. Um, I mean, I, th I think the Supreme, I, I, I'm not sure there's a whole heap between the, the, the few of them that re -oppose here. And, and then I was slightly tempted by Golden Ace at 13.0, at, at but I think probably the mayor, more I look back at that Mayor's Novice as early, it, the, there's a potential it was falsely run and maybe Golden Ace was just the best in a, in a, in a relatively sprint finish for that race. And Again, Dysart Enos, for, for all that she comes there with an unblemished record, I'm not completely convinced what, what she's done yet and, and whether she can handle the, the step up to this sort of level. So I, I came down with lump sum for, for Sam Thomas and Sam Twiston Davis. He's had a really good season. Um, you know, he, he was beat by Jericho de Repone at Doncaster, who, who I don't think got the chance to really show what he's about uh, with the cloud over the Henderson yard. But, apart, but that was on good ground as well. And then he bounced back on soft in the the dove could at Kenton and and readily beat fiercely proud four and a half lengths and earlier on the year we had a, a winner on heavy at Wing Canton as well so he's going to handle conditions really really well he's still got a, a, a relatively a, we we don't quite know the ceiling of his ability and I thought at fifteen point zero compared to plenty of these I, I, again I just thought he was too big and and the fact that he didn't go to Cheltenham which has got to be a positive moving on to Aintree kind of, yeah, tipped him even more in, in the balance for me. So I thought 15.0 was was really interesting about lump sum in this race. 15.0 lump sum. We move on from the top novices hurdle to the Melling Chase. And a couple of you with Pick Dory. Basically, no one's with John Bond. I am, obviously. But uh, Pick Dory again, Charlie and Matt. I'll come back to you, Charlie. You two are, are, are in agreement with a few horses this Thursday, Friday. Why Pick Dory, Charlie? I uh, just could his target all, all along. You know, he 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 won this race last season. He was very impressive in it, beating Fakir Dudari. Um, You know, not much has gone wrong. He, yes, he was beat by Bambridge on good to soft ground at Kenton in January, but. Bambridge is a very, very good horse on, on decent ground. And then I thought his defeat of Long Press, granted we had a hoy senor and Long Press probably over short of their trip, but he was a ready winner and he did what he always does. You know, he, he bowled along. He was very impressive in doing so. Paul immediately said that he wouldn't be going to Cheltenham. I think we're all well aware it isn't his thing and that he'd be coming back here for this race. And, and the fact that, yeah, he arrives here, with no run since the 17th of February. He's fresh. 
We know he loves the track. Conditions, if it ends up heavy, are maybe slightly more up in the air, but he has got plenty of slow ground form against his name. And and look, John Bon has an enormous amount of ability, but I'm different to you, Tom. I'm wary of being with the Henderson horses. And, you know, then you're looking at Protectorad is, is third in the market. And I just think a peak form pick Dory over these conditions is better than Protectorat. So I thought pick Dory was, was a really good bet actually at 4.33. Matt? Yeah, yeah, echo all of that. Um, for a lot of punters, you know, they, they look at a price around four point three, and they wouldn't look at playing in the place market or in the sportsbook uh, each way terms because yeah, you know, if you finish his second or third, you lose nearly twenty percent of your stake. Uh, uh, he's just such a solid horse. He's had eight runs in the last two seasons, won six of them. Second uh, to Shishkin and Bambridge, giving him three pounds. Uh, as Charlie said, he's a really good horse on good ground. You know he's going to run his race. Um, I think he's a big price here. All right. I, just John Bond, uh, obviously we don't know that he's going to run his race, but I, like I've said, I'm being positive about the Henderson Yard. Uh, the fact that they're coming here fresh, I think, is a big plus. And I think that a lot of them will outrun their inflated odds because of the question mark. But I'm taking a view... And that view is that Sergino is going to bolt up on day one of the meeting and everything else will thereby shorten. And I could see John Bond going off a point shorter than he is currently at 3.5. So that, that's what I hope happens. Obviously, if Sergino bows, blows out, then I look like a, a, an idiot, which is, which is you know, potentially quite likely. But I do think John Bond will be suited by the distance as well. And I think he's just far and away the most talented of these. And still an eight-year-old. There's just so much upside to him over this distance. So I will have him on side. Dees. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'd be between John Bond if if, if the, the other Henderson horses run well. Um, I think he's he's a class horse. I always like them. I'm gone for Protect Rat. Um, <clears throat> I thought his win in the Ryanair was was incredibly impressive. I think he was he 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 won going away from from decent horses. Um, he's dropping back and trip a small bit here, but I mean he's he was you know he ran well in the Gold Cup previously. I would think the ground is going to, as I said, no, I think the ground is going to be heavy. I think he probably want to stay a bit further than two and a half miles. He's one in the course and distance. Um, he, he's two wins at entry on his on his uh, CV. You know he he bombed out a bit last year, but that was after running in the Gold Cup. Um, hopefully he's a bit more left in the tank, and I uh, I fancy him to beat these yet. All right, at a well, bigger price than the first two we put up. That's the 330, the Melling Chase. The Topham is up next. The 405 big price is going up here. Notably, Charlie, take this one away. Yeah, I mean, this is it's proper chancy, this, but um, I put up sealed in the airship at 41.0, I think, right now. Uh, you know, he had plenty of, of top class handicap form including, well, he, he was in the process of running a really big race in, in this last year behind Bill Baxter when he, he unseated two out, uh, you know, again, a, couple, a, a good run at Galway beyond uh, after that. And, and then he was transferred after his next start to, to Ben Haslam, for who has done fantastic work for JP McManus through the years with these horses that have been transferred from, yeah, forgive me for saying, probably bigger yards. And you know, he arrived at Ben's with a mark of 145. He's now down in three starts, down to 130. And look, the first two starts at Doncaster and Kelso, he didn't beat another rival home. But there was slight grounds for a little bit of improvement. The last day behind Shake Him Up, Harry, he was granted he was still beat 36 lengths when 14 to 21 at Cheltenham. But maybe these fence are what he needs. You know, like he turns up here twenty-two pounds lower than that run last season when he was in the process of of definitely being in amongst it, and I just thought that was too much to to bypass. So it could be madness, but yeah, forty-one point zero win and place sealed in the edge for me for Richie McLearn and Ben Haslam. I love it. I hope it. I hope it cops. Uh, I'll chance James De Berle, who's twelve point three for the Topham, who. Uh, I, th I think this is his distance. I think the fences will really suit. He's got form in, in, in some of the best handicaps going over the Christmas period. And, and you know, he, he didn't run badly last time. Uh, his finishing effort concerned me slightly. 
but I, I he's also on the side trying these fences at 12.3 win and plays yeah it was all set to tip up Bill Baxter he's a strong favorite you know that always waning an ultra gold winning uh, this is sequentially uh, but he's into about 6.0 now so I may play at him if he drifts back out um, instead I'm going to go with a bigger price sometimes you see Willie Mullins running horses over trips they don't look to get um, perhaps this is a consequence of his having had so many good novices for a long time that in maiden hurdles especially, and also beginners' chases, he runs them when they're working well rather than waiting for the ideal trip. And now he has so many good horses to juggle that more recently it seems to lead to some horses who've won their maiden or beginners over a trip that doesn't suit, they keep running over it, even when it looks pretty clearly the wrong trip. Blood Destiny looks an example this season. And I think classic getaways as well. He looked a blatant non-stayer at two miles seven uh, when reeled in late by a jungle boogie at Tremor on New Year's Day. After pulling up after a bad mistake at DRF, he was then turned over at odds on in a minor conditions race at three mile two at Down Royal. Again, travelled well, didn't get home. So winning this off 155 won't be easy, but Cadmium won it for Willie off 152, making most of the running, as did Live Love Laugh off 145. I think Classic Getaway is a better horse than either of those. And with Paul choosing James de Burley, is a huge price. Um, hopefully Patrick can repeat the forcing tactics he used on Live, Love, Laugh. Well suited, as we discussed, to the two mile five races over the national fences. Um, and I think he could outclass these. Jeff Ormish says, I was at Aintree this morning. Very heavy rain like it has been since Monday. Woo. Uh, there we are. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, have we all had a go here? No, Dees, I've missed you out. My apologies. Dees. Yeah, the, the one I wanted to put up was Ferro Bamboo, but Venetia's yards are they are just running terrible. Um, you know, she, she actually the winner there yesterday, but before that, she had six horses that were pulled up, so I will be avoiding him. That's one of those things I, really, I, I, I tip him, but I don't really tip him. <laughs> the one I like, the one I like is uh, Amy Deji, another William Mullins horse. Um, he's a nine year old, but he is very unexposed. This is, this is only going to be his fourth chase. Um, they, they actually bought him in, in, in 2019, but he was uh, he was out in the field for a couple of years. But he's been quite progressive um, this year. He started off in a, a maiden hurdle last August, and he has um, won uh, at the start of March. He won a chase and heavy ground at Goran. Um, jump away, I think. If you can jump around Goran heavy ground, you can jump around the uh, you can jump around the entry heavy ground. He's in there now about 17.0. There's been a bit of money for him. Um, Danny Mullins is on him. Look, I, I think today like, he's massively unexposed. Um, they're not sending him over for a look around the place. Um, I think he could be a, a sneaky one. So I have him at 17.0. A uh, quick question, uh, Matt. Did, did uh, Freire Bamboo stay in the plate like he didn't last year? Or or, or what what happened there? Should, should yeah. they have in the two-mile race, do you think? I, think? I think that could be a good idea, Tom, because, again, in the plate, travelled beautifully and didn't get home. That weird, that. Maybe it's next year. Like a I wonder if they should run him in the plate again next year. Yeah, let's keep running him in the plate. <laughs> yeah, I reckon so. As opposed to the trip which suits him best, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we'll put him up anti post as our best handicap bet for the two mile race. And yeah, great. No, good, good. I'm glad you mentioned Ferro Bambudis because it, it just pissed me off. <laughs> you keep dipping them, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he runs. <laughs> This horse is well handicapped. He's well handicapped for about three years. Right. Sefton Novices <laughs> Hurdle. Uh, nothing for me. Goodness me, we've got a team steam. I love it when this happens. Uh, the floor is yours. Who who feels strongest about Croke Park? Take, just speak. Well, well, I, good. I, would, I, would, I would start off by saying that I would not be back in anything that ran in the Albert Battle on Friday until at least well into next season. They're young horses, that was heavy ground, it was a tough race and massive negative. And that's that's the top three. Um Shannon Bob is trained by Nicky Henderson, which we don't know how they're going to do on Crow Park was um has always looked like a door three miles there. He'll be a good chaser. Um he's a nice price as well for this. You could do a win place if you want. Um Kintara, this is a huge step up in, in grade for all that that he would really like the heavy ground and it was a knock in the poor temps. And um I don't really know much about the other three, so that was my uh that was my reasoning there for, for Croke Park. Uh, uh, uh Matt Toombs, what do you want to add? 
Yeah, just that Gordon's really strong in this division. You know, mm-hmm. Albert Bartlow and Estella Story, the Norris dominated Martin Pike, better days ahead, had half a dozen in this and is relying on Croke Park. Agree absolutely with what DC has said. Um, he's not been having a, a lot of winners, Gordon, but he's not been having many favourites. A lot of his lesser lights have been running. So at the moment, I'm not too worried about the uh, yard form. I'll be keeping an eye on that on Thursday. But uh, yeah, Croke Park looks like he's absolutely cut out for a test like this. Charlie Post. Yeah, I just said, yeah, I agree with all of that. And I mean, I, I, I was going to put him up for the Albert Bartlett when he was a late absentee. So the fact that he's, he's missed that race and, and that very attritional contest surely is a major positive for, for, for this race. And, and yeah, like Dee said, he, he looks all the world like he's going to make up into a staying chaser and a stamina test is what he wants and that's what he's going to get. So yeah, Crow Park at 9.0, I thought again was a, a really good bet. That is that's us done for uh, Thursday and Friday. Any other Friday bets, Dees? Just you in the five fifteen, sir. Yeah, I just avoid cash with this horse because this there could be um, uh, the horse is Dinsworth. Sorry, I should say in, in the last race, um, Ben Pauling's horse um, he came back from nearly a year out to win by sixteen lengths on heavy ground at Doncaster, the the, the same card as, as the Grimthorpe. So it was fairly heavy going. Um, he's back here on this now. Um, this is a second run after wind surgery. Could bounce. No, he wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a huge, um, a huge long uh, break he had. But um, again, he he would have had a hard rest that way. He was a bit bigger on price when I was looking at him this morning. I think he was about fourteen point zero when I was looking at him. But uh, he's in there about eleven point zero. Um, I just think he 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 caught my eye. He he's been in my tracker for a while and uh, um. For, for for heavy road for this kind of race. So uh, the last race, the lucky last on Friday, Denzel works for Ben Pauling. Match with zero, long shot match with zero goes live at 10 a.m. every day. Go there if you want to win bet on anything because you are very likely to be getting better odds because it's match with zero with zero margin, zero commission. Mine is Might I, who should probably call Might Not or Won't, but anyway, Might I, 17.0. Charlie? Lump sum for me, uh, 15.0. Matt, classic getaway at twenty six point zero in the top. I think a few people are going to back that. DC, Amy Deji in the the top. Is it top? Yeah. Matt, just a lay for you. Yeah, Dyson Enos uh, in both the win and especially the place mark in the top novices. She's campaigned in weak races to avoid getting a penalty in the door run. Now ends up here in a Grade One uh, against the Geldings. <laughs> Hurdles form hasn't worked out. I'm short on meaningful experience over flights. Whether she's ready for this, I'm not sure. Best Friday bets. Mine is Mystical Power. Charlie. Crow Park, but I did want Pick Dory, but Matt Toombs beat me to it. There you go, Matt. Uh, well, I actually wanted to do with Croke Park. I just made a mistake and put Pick Dory down, so I'll stick with that. Like both of those. And DC is for bamboo. DC is you. As a back to lie. Mine, mine would have been a protector act, but I thought we had to do a different races for a lucky 15, so I put on Firefox, but I'd give a protector act a good show as well. Okay, well, I just put in Mystical Power because I wanted to take you on, so there we are. Yeah, nice one. We are there. Join us at 4.45 tomorrow for the preview of Grand National Saturday. No doubt we'll be kicking off with that race. And then uh, we'll be going back through the the rest of the Saturday action. So that is 4.45 tomorrow. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks to the team as well for all of their bets. Head to insights.matchbook.com for a recap of all of the best bets. And most importantly, have a tremendous Aintree Festival. Bye-bye.